Hello everyone, I'm Jim Skelly and I've um, just come back from a trip to the United States during which I did a number of interviews and also recorded a talk that uh, Daniel Ellsberg, who is famous as some of you know, for having released the Pentagon Papers um, during the latter years of the Vietnam War that the United States was prosecuting and had been prosecuting since the early 1960s. Ellsberg released the Pentagon Papers in 1971. They were a compilation of uh, documents, uh, the true history essentially of the Vietnam War, and they give a very deep sense of the cover-ups, the secrecy, etc., and what led to the war. Um, there were, of course, as you might imagine, many officials who were uh, more than irritated. Um, President, then President Richard Nixon attempted to prosecute uh, Ellsberg. He suffered a great deal of harassment and, and uh, other uh, uncomfortable uh, projects uh, designed by the President and his allies. Uh, I think what is interesting for all of us is uh, the connection that he makes and that many of us make between um, his activities uh, with the Pentagon Papers uh, and the activities of Julian Assange in WikiLeaks and also uh, the young soldier who is uh, purported to have helped uh, Assange uh, with the release of uh, a number of documents. Uh, that young soldier is uh, Bradley Manning, who has been uh, kept in uh, what must, uh, I, what I must admit, seems to be horrific conditions, uh, as totally uncalled for conditions. He hasn't been charged with any crimes, and yet he is being held in prison by the United States government, um, in I would guess in contravention of uh, certain constitutional rights that even soldiers have. A at any rate. Um, uh, the following um, video and then audio tape, we messed up, I'm sorry, I messed up the video, uh, was done uh, at the Wellfleet meeting, the annual Wellfleet meeting organized by Dr. Robert J. Lifton, who was uh, one of the leading experts on genocide and other horrors um, uh, uh, that is held in uh, his study seminars held in his study in Kit Cod uh, every year. Uh, and so what follows now is uh, Dan Ellsberg's discussion of um, Bradley Manning, WikiLeaks, Julian Assange, and his own release of the Pentagon Papers. Uh, if you have comments about it, I'd love to hear them. Thanks very much. I was reading uh, the Odes of Horus this morning as I try to do every morning before I shave, and um, particularly looking up on Google here, a uh, famous one from Book 2, Part 2, Dulce et decorum est, O Patria Mori, how sweet, it is sweet and fitting to die for one's country. And that phrase has become very familiar to many Americans and Brit Brits, from one of the most famous poems of World War II, of course. It's, wow. Here's the last wow. line by Wilfred Owen. World War, World War I. World War I. Uh, what did I say, World War II? Yeah. yeah, World War I, right. Would you read it one more time? I'm, <laughs> I'm so old, these wars get confused in my mind. So, um, the line is, of course, um, it is sweet and fitting to die for one's country. This is a translation. Yet death chases after the soldier who runs and won't spare the cowardly, but uh, or the limbs of peace-loving young men. And I did read in Google what I hadn't read before that this uh, last line: "It is sweet and fitting to die for one's country," which Wilfred Owen quoted. In uh, I think I'll just read very quickly here. At the time, the end of his poem, where he's he died seven days before the armistice, o Owen did, but this was written earlier about a man who doesn't get his gas mask on in time when they're retreating from the front, and uh, he's uh, uh, struggling with his mask, uh, doesn't get it on in time, 
So Owen and others have to tow him onto the truck where he dies as Owen describes it as follows. Well, I'm sure I'll find it. Never mind. The, um, yeah, here it is. Actually, what, I, what I'm having trouble finding is that um, it turns out that Owen, you probably heard this description, but he was ri- reading, he was writing the poem in a uh, dedication to a woman named Jessie uh, who had s- cheered people on to the front. Uh, join the game, boys, the great game of war. Uh, better to come home in a crutch than to sit at home and regret that you didn't get into the game. And Owen first dedicated this poem to uh, to her and then took that out. But, uh, of course, yes, here, it, here is the description. Gas, gas, quick, and so forth. In all my dreams, before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. If in some smothering dreams you too you see behind the ways we uh, behind the truck we flung him in and watch white eyes writhing in his eyes his hanging face like a devil sick of sin if you could hear at every jolt the blood come gurgling from the froth corrupted lungs obscene as cancer bitter o oh, vile incurable souls sores, I'm sorry, on innocent tongues. My friend, you would not tell with such high zest the children ardent for some desperate glory. The old lie, dulce et decorum est pro patria mori. There's a young man in prison right now in Leavenworth named Bradley Manning. I just looked up, courtesy minutes ago on Google, his latest uh, condition. He was moved uh, to Leavenworth after a lot of civil disobedience and uh, at the White House and in Quantico, where I used to work at Quantico, uh, in the Marine Corps, where he was imprisoned in solitary confinement for over eight months in a very small cell, 23 hours a day, not allowed out, uh, not to eat meals with other prisoners, not allowed to talk to anyone on his way to exercise, which consisted of running, of walking figure eights in a very small room. Uh, they would announce uh, uh, everybody locked down, locked down, so that no one could talk to him on his way to this other room in isolation for, uh, for that period. Uh, Obama was asked about this condition. He had not been charged yet and is not yet formally charged, although he has now, just this week, apparently been found fit for trial despite <coughs> his confinement, which was clearly meant to break him down to testify against, uh, to try to testify to relations with Julian Assange uh, that might help charge Julian Assange with something, who is, has a grand jury uh, sitting on him in Virginia, but they haven't yet, quote, found the law that they are going to charge him with. And I'll tell why that's a peculiar problem at this moment. I know that better than most people. Anyway, as a result of the, uh, prob- of the uh, protests, which included Obama being asked at a fundraiser, uh, after all, uh, why was he being treated like this? And they said, oh, he's being treated normally, ordinarily, not explaining that it was ordinarily for someone on supposedly suicide watch and maximum security. There was no one on those two conditions or, or had been for many years, if ever. So it was normally for such a person that he'd be total isolation. And in fact, somebody asked Obama, after all, didn't he do just what Daniel Ellsberg did? <laughs> Obama, Obama had already said, by the way, as commander in chief, presiding over a military court martial, which is what Manning will receive if he is, and presumably when he is tried. He said, uh, he's guilty. He committed a crime, uh, which is somewhat prejudicial uh, in terms of uh, since the officers who will sit on him now would have to contradict their commander-in-chief if they acquitted him at that point. But that hasn't been found a reason for withdrawing him from a military court-martial. So then he was asked, well, didn't he do exactly what Daniel Ellsberg did? And Obama, I've seen this, you can find it on YouTube easily enough. Obama said, Daniel Ellsberg 
uh, released information of a different order of sensitivity. That's true, actually. Uh, mine was top secret. So, uh, the highest classification that Bradley is accused of uh, putting out was secret or confidential or unclassified. So, so much for Obama. And uh, he was, however, moved to Leavenworth, where I just read he is allowed to be with other prisoners. The UN Rapporteur for Torture, where, uh, book here, where's uh, Michael? Has it? Where's Michael? Not here? <coughs> I was talking to him about uh, the book he's doing on the treatment of torture uh, now. It's coming out, Torture and the Screen. Of course, since the 24, the television series, is a major factor. But above all, because our president, uh, our president Bush, uh, legitimized torture as necessary. He actually brags of it all as waterboarding, as does Cheney, despite the fact that nothing is more illegal and criminal than torture. Uh, in domestic law and international law, and in terms of several laws. Uh, that has changed ad people's attitudes toward torture who are now mainly supportive of it if the president feels it's necessary. And that has been very fairly confirmed by our present president, the constitutional scholar, who has publicly refrained and refused to prosecute anybody for any of the laws broken during the Bush administration, which were many, uh, which is very like the, uh, the pardon that was given by Ford to Nixon for anything he might have done during that earlier period. Uh, this is a blanket amnesty for Bush officials, but very specifically, Barack Obama has in effect decriminalized torture uh, since he's announced it's not to be prosecuted. It will be very hard for any successor now to uh, prosecute it after this, after uh, 12 or 16 years of non-prosecution for torture. Why are we talking about torture? Because the UN rapporteur, Juan Mendez, asked to see him because uh, and was refused uh, during the eight months he was in Leavenworth to see Bradley Manning uh, at all, as was, by the way, Dennis Kucinich, as a member of the uh, government committee, was refused the opportunity to see Manning. And now they're allowing uh, Mendez, this is today's news, three days ago, to... Um, see Manning on condition that it will be monitored. And since the UN rapporteur, the agreements are they must see people privately uh, and Manning has refused to waive that, that right and Mendez says he would see him non-privately if, if Manning uh, wanted to do it, but Manning has not waived that. So Mendez says he's not able to see him and the reason he wanted to see him was that solitary confinement under these conditions is torture. And he's conducting, of course, it's very widely done in this country and elsewhere. Uh, in other words, people are tortured very, very widely. Uh, but they're trying to get that recognized more clearly as torture. And he says, Mendez says there are occasions uh, for uh, security of the person or for others where it could be justified. But he said it is commonly, I don't have that in front of me here, it is commonly done to coerce a confession in order to prosecute someone else. And in that case, it constitutes criminal torture. So uh, that is uh, the statement then that we don't torture people by Obama is uh, mistaken even for American citizens. But uh, of course, what was revealed by the WikiLeaks second set of revelations allegedly coming from Bradley Manning dealing with Iraq was uh, perhaps a thousand separate reports of our handing people over to Iraqis with the knowledge that they would be tortured. Now, that happens to be as criminal as the torture itself. We are not allowed to send somebody over, and we, the, as a signing member of the Geneva Convention here, we are compelled legally to investigate and to stop any allegations of torture like this. What Bradley Manning says in the chat logs, which are our main basis of our knowledge about him, to the man who, uh, Adrian Lamo, who turned him in and gave the chat logs over there to be found on Wired magazine, you can find them on the web. Uh, what he says was that what changed him from being a, a uh, student, uh, I'm sorry, a uh, volunteer in the army who was pursuing college degree, eventually, and glory, 
patriotism uh, coming from a very uh, traditional isolated background, Crescent, Oklahoma, though being something of a, a considerable dissenter in that particular environment. Um, what changed him in his attitudes of his very his pride in having quite a sensitive and important job in uh, analyzing intelligence data was that he was asked to uh, turn over a bunch of Iraqis, seemed to be scholars, over to uh, Iraqi police from our custody uh, and with the clerk knowledge that they would be tortured by his boss. And the documents that were the basis of his charge, he said, uh, of charging them, he had translated by an Iraqi interpreter and discovered that they were a scholarly discussion of corruption within the current Iraqi government and that that was all that they were. Allegedly. So he said he ran to his boss, a, a lieutenant who was in charge of these interrogations, or rather prisoners, and uh, Ted, these people uh, uh, shouldn't be imprisoned. Uh, they're political prisoners and they shouldn't be tortured. And the uh, boss said, shut up, just shut up, do not investigate this further and do your job. And his job was to collect more such people. He said as a result of that, knowing that there was not only a crime being committed, but covered up, that uh, he felt, along with that and other things he was beginning to read, that I was participating actively in things I was totally against. And the question was, what should he do about it? Now, a lot of people knew that much, and I've met a number of them who did that much. In fact, Camilo Mejia, the first uh, sergeant who refused to go back to Iraq, and I testified at his trial at his hearing for being a CEO while he was being imprisoned in, uh, in, uh, in Arkansas. Had much the same feeling. And uh, uh, the question is, what do you do? Uh, do you refuse like Mejia or do you do more than that? He also came across a video of uh, which uh, some of you have seen and the others should see. How many of you have seen the video entitled Collateral murder, which brought uh, WikiLeaks. Now, wait, that's a very small number. Can you raise your I hand? Seen it, huh? How many have not seen this? Mm -hmm. Okay, very easy to find it. Look up on Google, uh, just write collateral murder, a very controversial title which Julian Assange gave it, uh, and which was the main subject of discussion in the media, whether it was the right title or not, or whether he should have just said permission to engage, because that's a running theme throughout. This video, it's from a, it's from a helicopter uh, uh, camera of a uh, armed helicopter in Iraq. We see men looking at some unarmed men right. down below, a dozen unarmed men, clearly in civvies, one of them with an RPG. Uh, another one with something that the people in the, in the film take rather hastily to be an RPG, although if you look at the video, it doesn't seem too hard to see that it's a camera with a telephoto lens, uh, held by, this you wouldn't know, by a Reuters uh, reporter, and next to him is his driver. So, uh, Reuters driver. So they're walking very casually with this did helicopter you say that, up above. Did, did you say there was an RPG? Uh, yeah, there is. Uh, it's a, this is very controversial, but Assange says in his own book, he said, yes, you can see an RPG in there. That wasn't, by the way, there's a lot of RPGs walking around, you know, being held around by all kinds of people in Baghdad. They're very widely held. Doesn't, it doesn't tell you very much. Uh, the, uh, so, okay, they're walking along. Permission to engage, permission to engage. We have enemies down there. They get the permission, and I won't go through the whole thing. Watch it. It's, it has subtitles, and you can hear, the, hear it pretty well. But suddenly these men are, are like the Wilfred Owen thing in a way, uh, flattened, scattered into the dust. They disintegrated practically. They're hit with small cannon, actually, from the ship, not just bullets. And so they pretty well are shattered into dust. But two of them, by coincidence, uh, the Reuters ph uh, photographer and his, his runner are wounded and are crawling away. And they go around some an obstruction in the way. The helicopter follows them around. They're clearly wounded. An armed squad is of, of Americans is on the way. It's about a block away. You hear all this in the chatter. They're coming to the area. But as the men come into the open, the men, 
they focus on them again and they splatter both of them now. These, un, these wounded men who are crawling to get away. A van, meanwhile, has driven up, seeing all these bodies in the square. And you can see some figures fairly faintly in the video in the front of the van. Uh, ordinary man. And again, permission to, permission to engage, and I forget whether they got it or not, but anyway, they blow the van to pieces. The van has come up here fairly obviously to collect. In fact, I think the driver, who was the father of the two children who were in the front seat, has gotten out to try to get the body, and uh, these bleeding bodies, and, and try to help them. He's killed. The van is shot up. You see in the picture, uh, now the armed squad has gotten... This thing goes on for 38 minutes, the full thing, and then there was an edited version of 18 minutes. But uh, you see the squad come up, and you see an American soldier go into the van, rescue one of the children in their arms. This, you can see all this, quite dramatic. Takes it uh, out of the uh, to a, a vehicle a little further out. As it later turns out, this uh, man who did this named Ethan McCord uh, runs back then to get the other child, and his lieutenant says, "What the fuck are you doing? Get out of there! This isn't your job." And he says, "I'm saving these children." He said, "Fuck that! You know, get out of there. Uh, do your job. You know, or provide security." And as I recall, I think he disobeyed that order. I think he got the child, the other child. He certainly got one, and somebody got the other. Someone, and he's uh, Bradley Manning is accused of it. Finding, first saw this video, uh, it didn't say a lot to him at first because he'd seen a lot like it. Then he coordinated, he then collected it with uh, an intelligence report that was classified on this incident. And uh, which said that the, uh, which said that the soldiers of the shooting were within the rules of engagement, the ROE, there was no criminality here. And, uh, and the report, and then he connected it with the report that said so many had been killed, but no mention of any unarmed people or any civil, possible civilians or anything like that. So he felt there was a big cover-up going on. He may or may not have been aware, I can't remember at this moment, uh, what, that Reuters, knowing that their men had been killed in this incident, had, and knowing that there was a video, had for a year and a half been, under Freedom of Information Act, been trying to get this video. It called for it under Freedom of Information Act and had been refused. They never did get it. Uh, he did know that a um, Washington Post reporter did get a copy of the video, wrote a book about the war, fairly critical of all this, described the incident, but did not release the video or give it to Reuters, who was known. I think he mentioned that Reuters was trying to get this. He had it. He didn't give it to Reuters well, and he didn't put it what up. What was the book? I forgot. Oh, no, good easy, easy to find. What? What is it? David Finkel, good soldiers. David <coughs> Finkel, F I N K E L. Finkel, yeah, right. Great book. There's some controversy over whether he actually had the uh, video in hand or whether he had simply seen it. I've seen it written both ways, and uh, in the chat logs, uh, it was uh, Bradley Manning was under it said that he did have it. He knew this guy had it and had not released it, so it was not going to be seen unless someone, and he is accused, of releasing it to, we'll get the question, to uh, Julian Assange, to WikiLeaks. So it comes out, and that was WikiLeaks' first big, uh, got a lot of attention, though not as much for the incident as he had hoped. A lot of attention on his having given it the title Collateral Murder. Now, when I was called on to comment on this, I forget why I was called, for not a joke, but somehow I got into this. And, uh, and I said, look, uh, I agree with the title. Uh, I'm a uh, Marine platoon leader, company commander, and I was battalion training officer, and I trained on the laws of war. And we're talking on very deliberately choosing to shoot wounded men, unarmed, in civvies, while ground soldiers are on the way to take custody. That's murder. Can there be murder in war? Yes. Is all killing in war murder? No. But some of it is. Actually, a lot of it is. More than gets reported. This is murder. So uh, the word collateral is a question. It was very deliberate. It wasn't, they weren't killed in a crossfire. Just murder. And um, was anybody tried for it? No, because the rules of engagement 
uh, allowed. Apparently, they were doing just what they were doing. Now, Bradley Manning was very was very pleased with the amount of attention that this got, according to the chat logs. He said that convinced him that it was worth putting stuff out, because people did notice what war actually looked like and what was happening, and he thought that might make a difference. Assange, I might mention, as he says in his autobiography, unauthorized autobiography, so called, uh, did get a lot of attention, but he, he raised it in a press conference himself, so it was his thing, and most of the media did not pick it up. I think CNN actually did show it, but the networks did not on the whole. And he realized that what he should have done, after all, was give it to a network to begin with and make it theirs so they would push it. So not as many people saw it as he could. I do urge you all to see it. Very easy to, to see this. Say there's two versions, 15-minute version. See the 38-minute version. And uh, so, as I say, Assange thought, okay, next time I'll, I'm going to deal with the newspapers directly. Get this stuff out. Manning, however, was particularly struck not only by this, but he read about, and saw, of course, and he read about the name of the young soldier who uh, was interviewed who had run out and rescued the children. And so he said he got into a correspondence with him on email. And he mentions on the chat log, this is the major amazing thing about the Internet age. Here he said, here I put this out and there's the film. And then he said, of course, he didn't know who I was, says Manning. You know, I'm just somebody congratulating him for what he did. Now, what uh, they, without knowing who they talked to, um, man, uh, there was two people wrote a letter together <coughs> when they got out of the army shortly after. Uh, again, the internet age, what you can do now huh, these days. Um, one was Ethan McCord, who was the one who rescued the children, and the other was a guy named Josh Steber, who was had also just gotten out. Who they had not known each other before they got out on this, and, and they read, they saw the video, and uh, Ethan, of course, recognized himself in the video, and uh, Steber was in the same company with the helicopter, which, by the way, it turns out later, this is a later leak, was the same helicopter that had earlier, uh, about a month earlier, slaughtered a bunch of people who were trying to surrender. And the leaked conversation on that occasion is, they call back and say, what should we do? These people have their arms in the air. Uh, they're trying to surrender. And the instructions they get from their base is, you can't surrender to an airplane. <coughs> Waste them. You know, shoot them down. Or something. So they shoot them. So they shot them. Um, same helicopter, interestingly. But again, under the rules of engagement. Uh, no problem. Steber then says, I was in that company. I could have been in that helicopter. I happened to be off that day. And uh, I've seen many things like this. So they have been on an almost continuous tour since this, thanks to the Manning uh, revelation and the WikiLeaks revelation. I'm saying Manning hypothetically here, of course. And because uh, the Army gives him credit for it, so I'll give him credit for it, uh, short of anything else. And they wrote an open letter of reconciliation and responsibility to the Iraqi people. And I won't read the whole letter, but you can get that easily. Look up um, McCord, Ethan McCord, and Josh Steber, which I just did here uh, on the Internet. And part of the letter is this. We are both soldiers who occupied your neighborhood for 14 months. Ethan McCord pulled your daughter and son from the van. By the way, Julian, who's accused of not being a journalist, or he's a publisher, also a publisher, <laughs> did not release this until he had sent two people to Baghdad at their expense to try to find the two children who were the survivors of this incident, who they found, and the widow of the Reuters journalist. And they got their stories, and they got the story of the widow, and they brought it back, and they confirmed everything, something that no other press did, you know, made any effort to do whatever on this, to follow this up. Josh Steber was in the same company, but not there that day, although he contributed to the pain, the pain of your Now, I want to read three paragraphs. There is no bringing back. This is a statement now by two American soldiers to the people of Iraq. Let me just say, I haven't seen anything like this by the soldiers of any country in any war in human history. And this is not Homer reporting this, and this is not 
uh, Jim Jones or somebody. These are the two people who are writing in their own names. There is no bringing back all that is lost. What we seek is to learn from our mistakes and to do everything we can to tell others of our experiences and how the people of the United States need to realize what we have done and are doing to you and the people of your country. We humbly ask you what we can do to begin to repair the damage we caused. We have been speaking to whoever will listen, telling them that what was shown in the WikiLeaks video only begins to depict the suffering we have created. From our own experiences and the experiences of other veterans we have talked to, we know that the acts depicted in this video are everyday occurrences of this war. This is the nature of how U.S.-led wars are carried out in this region. And by the way, are being carried out today as we speak in uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iraq, so my helicopters there working away. We acknowledge our part in the deaths of. Um, we acknowledge this is the last. Year. We acknowledge our part in the deaths and injuries of your loved ones as we tell Americans what we were trained to do and what we carried out in the name of God and country. The soldier in the video said that your husband. Oh, this is a voice in the video. When they see that they've killed children, I mean, wounded children. Someone says, "Oh God, they're children." In the, and one of the voices said, well, shit, what are they doing bringing children into a battle zone? <laughs> battle zone where these people were walking casually under a helicopter. You know, and, uh, the soldier in the video said that your husband shouldn't have brought your children to battle. But we are now acknowledging our responsibility for bringing the battle to your neighborhood and to your family. We did unto you what we would not want done to us. More and more Americans are taking responsibility for what was done in our name. Though we have acted with cold hearts far too many times, we have not forgotten our actions toward you. Our heavy hearts still hold hope that we can restore inside our country the acknowledgement of your humanity that we were taught to deny. It goes on. And they have, in fact, continued, both of them, with their, well, for nothing but travel expenses. Uh, been traveling all over the country for the last two years, <coughs> two years essentially. Now, Manning saw that letter also that he had evoked. As I say, I've never read anything like that, so I encourage you to read the whole letter. And they've written. If you look up their names, you'll see they've written lots of other stuff too, and YouTube's. Um, next, he decided. It seems somebody gave. Uh, the Afghanistan cables and they gave Iraq cables. The Afghanistan cables revealed that we had a group called 373. The Times failed to report this from the cables they were given, the New York Times, but it was published in Der Spiegel, to whom Assange, quite ingeniously, not with no journalistic background, by the way, he's a hacker, he's a computer expert, but Assange had the uh, ingenuity to bring several newspapers into this so if one suppressed something, they would be under the pressure that somebody else would put it out. So Der Spiegel reported that Task Force 373, never reported in our press, uh, had assassinated thousands of individuals, including many that the report said were, by mistake, wrong people. In the Iran, Iraq uh, cables, which he then put out, they put out, uh, Revealed, uh, the press tended to say nothing much new here. Uh, you may have heard the phrase. Uh, find my words here. Heard the phrase. Uh, we don't do body counts mm -hmm. in this war because in one of my wars, the Vietnam War, of course, they were put down for the coldness of counting bodies as a measure of success. They said we don't do body counts. And they said, well, that was a lie. It turned out from the reports that they did do body counts of civilians, including military. So each report, of which there were thousands, incorporated so many civilians, so many civilians. Well, they added up to a, uh, finally Bush got up to the figure, before he got out, of 40,000 civilian deaths. A lot, 10, 9, 11s. But meanwhile, Lancet, of course, the report from Johns Hopkins, said at the same time, which was 2006, five years ago, over a million 
big range. Uh, the a group called the Iraq Body Count had been keeping count only of reports that were by two different reports of newspaper accounts. You know, a tremendous undercount, of course, of what dying over there, according to Lancet. And they'd gotten up to about uh, 98,000. Well, civilian deaths. When the Iraq body count to whom Assange gave this voluminous file to, they went over it in detail. As I say, the army had been doing body counts. They had 60,000 civilian deaths compared to the Iraq body counts, 98,000. But the 60,000, then you could check by coordinates and times and days, so you knew exactly what incident was what incident. The 60,000 included 15,000 that had not been reported in the press. So the Iraq body count increased its number from 98,000 to 113,000. The actual number may be a million and a half, but you know, who's counting? And the answer is well, the army to a small degree, uh, certainly not the military, not the media, not, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So among that, uh, what was revealed there is the army's counting of 60,000 civilian deaths, including 15,000 that had never been reported before. And that could be regarded as news, although it wasn't generally so regarded. What Manning said then about the cables that were released, uh, getting to the end here, I'll, I'll, I'm sure there'll be questions about the questions of redaction, the questions of uh, whether some things were released that should not have been released. The answer is yes. The Afghan war logs had names of people in there that Assange should not have released, put out too early. He learned from that. Fortunately, I would say, the army has said ever since they have no evidence that anyone actually was harmed as a result of that. One, not one person, but could have been. The Iraq war logs were greatly redacted, and Assange only put out on WikiLeaks what the press had put out, and they did redact with the help of the State Department and the Defense Department. And <coughs> Assange, WikiLeaks accepted all those redactions. So no charge has been made about the Iraq war logs. I, there's, I could put a footnote on that, but that's basically true. On the cables, uh, as of a few months ago, when by a series of fuck-ups by uh, the Guardian, a guy named former WikiLeaks person named Dom Scheitberg, and David Lee of the Guardian, who put out the password for the entire amount, and Assange, who had allowed uh, the whole thing encrypted to be on the web. So they put this all together, and this stuff did come out. And then Assange did, it having come out, put it on his website, which I would say was a mistake to give more importance to it. There may or may not be harm from doing that. Certainly there's a potential harm from putting all these cables out. Prior to that, prior to that, uh, whereas everybody always talked about the indiscriminate leaking of 260,000 cables, uh, take two more minutes, indiscriminate leaking, up till that time, a couple months ago, the newspapers, many newspapers, had put out 2% of what Assange had given them. Uh, not exactly indiscriminate. And WikiLeaks had put out only what the newspapers had put out, which I thought was a good good print. So he'd learned from this and had gotten better. A lot of concern about uh, the dangers of secret telling. And there are dangers. Potentially, at least, they may become real. The dangers of secret keeping include Vietnam and Iraq and Afghanistan and I could mention name other places in the world. I believe and we can get into specifics on this if there had been a Bradley Manning if he is indeed the hero hero of mine who did this if there had been a Bradley Manning in the White House or the Defense Department among the many who believed that these events were catastrophic and criminal, if one of them had risked his career or her career, I, at the right time and in the right way, 
I believe that all the dead could have been averted. These dead. It wouldn't end death in the world. It wouldn't end war. It wouldn't end violence, even in those areas. But the people who did die would not have died by the same bullets and by the same countries. When I read that Bradley Manning had said in his chat log, I'm prepared to go to prison for life or even be executed to get this up. I can say that I felt I've waited 40 years to hear somebody say that. That's what I felt in 1969, 70, 71. It appeared to me an appropriate uh, choice to make. Uh, I faced life imprisonment as he does right now. Every name that has been called Bradley Manning, which includes multiply, traitor, flake, madman, whatever, I got from the same authorities, including the president and the vice president. Uh, same charges faced against me. There is a problem, uh, a problem uh, trying Assange. No problem trying Bradley because he's in the military. They can get him for any one of a number of things, including downloading stuff on his computer that he shouldn't have downloaded. So they can put him away for that. Uh, for a civilian, <coughs> a little harder because for reasons we may go into in this summer, but uh, two reasons. We don't have a law intended to criminalize what Bradley Manning is accused of doing or what I did. Two, we do have a law that on its face in the plain language, Espionage Act, can apply to that. But it never it was not meant for that. And it's generally been held that if it were used for that, the Espionage Act, it would be unconstitutional to use it for leaking to the American people. That's why no one before me was ever prosecuted for leaking. I was the first. My trial ended for governmental misconduct. Before Obama, two other people were they attempted to prosecute under the Espionage Act for leaking. Obama dropped one of those cases, which had to do with the APAC people. And uh, there was one conviction. Three. Obama has brought five such prosecutions. And a grand jury is pursuing Assange. And uh, so twice as many if he gets Assange as all previous presidents put together. The reason it's only three, or six, or nine now, is, as I say, because earlier Supreme Courts would have found that conviction <coughs> unconstitutional as too great a violation of the words in the First Amendment, Congress shall pass no bill abridging freedom of speech or the press. And so we don't have what nearly every country has, like Britain, an Official Secrets Act. We don't yet have that. I think we will under Obama in the age of the war against terror. But we don't yet have it. So they yet haven't found charges. I'll end with that. I, it's obvious then I have this great identification of feeling with Bradley Manning, whom I've never met, perhaps never will meet. I wanted to get in to see him, but I didn't, couldn't get on his business list. Um, and um, he'll probably spend his life in prison, being in the army. Uh, I don't think he will ever regret uh, what he did. And uh, I don't think if, if he did it. And uh, I don't think that uh, Anne Assange uh, may, well, uh, may well try him. And I know that uh, he won't regret it. So that's where we are now, 2011. Thanks, Dan. Uh, could I ask you to say a little more about the general call it philosophy of WikiLeaks, of Assange and what he does and the group, and uh, maybe compare it also briefly to whistleblowing in terms of similarities. Of well, I'm no expert on that. I've read what's been published so far, which uh, all of which it's my understanding, and I, and I believe this has a lot of inaccuracies in it, but uh, it, uh, what is often quoted, for example, are some things that Assange wrote earlier, much earlier. Um, he's just had his 40th birthday. He was born uh, the week that the I was uh, indicted. <laughs> and uh, so I was surprised to hear from his biographer, Andrew Fowler, who said, you know, 
uh, did you know that Assange admires you very much and you're a hero of his? And I said, no, I didn't know that. I said, how could that be? I mean, you know, he's 40 years old, <laughs> born the week of the Pentagon Papers. Well, Fowler told me quite an interesting book about Assange. He said that his mother was a hippie protester and anti-war person, and he tells about this in his unauthorized autobiography. Very interesting. Uh, and was a very anti, a very big anti-Vietnam War protester, and he was brought up uh, admiring. She brought him up to admire the Pentagon Papers, and that that oh, and, and he had told Fowler, though it's not in the book, that the idea of the Pentagon Papers was uh, a germ in a seed in his hacker's mind. Uh, now he, as a very troubled childhood, happy in some ways, but then a number of years evading his mother's partner, his stepfather, who was a member of a very vicious cult, uh, the Anne Hamilton Byrne cult, the family in Australia, uh, which did a great deal of, of beating of children and starving and strangling. Assange didn't, didn't uh, experience this, but to keep him from experiencing it, his mother kept him constantly traveling because the father, stepfather, uh, Assange didn't know his biological father till his 20s, late 20s. But the stepfather kept finding out where they were. They were traveling all over Australia because the family had connections in the police and the intelligence apparatus and they could find out where he was. So he moved, he moved, he moved. He's pretty much self-taught. Uh, taught, but very brilliant kid working on computers. Did His formal studies were mostly on mathematics, physics, quantum mechanics. He became early, at about 16, a major hacker. And what the hackers uh, had a very great sense of, as you said, arrogance and freedom in breaking into, in making it their business to break into systems that were closely held. Corporate, but even things like uh, the military, American military, 8th, Eighth Air Force and so forth. So they liked to go inside those systems and just walk around. They didn't reveal things. They got a sense, he said, of how the world worked to some extent. But they didn't change it. They didn't reveal anything when he was finally caught and uh, by the Australian FBI and put on trial eventually. The judge eventually let them off with probation on the grounds that it was youthful, good spirits, and so forth. But they did develop a, a philosophy among other hackers, and there is apparently a hacker culture. This was new to me. I think of hackers as, as people like you know Rupert Murdoch, who break into phones and print gossip. Um, there, they did two things, interesting, which the same two things the National Security Agency does. They made codes and they broke codes, both of those. NSA, they worked in the same, same position, also from opposite sides. The hackers are obsessed with privacy of communication, of, their, of private individuals' communication. They have an anarchist, their uh, bent uh, flavor, uh, uh, which Assange acknowledges, says, I'm not an anarchist, but, you know, in this general philosophy. Liberty. Are they against all secrets? No. They make codes. They're very big on codes. Uh, that's why it was not good when David Lee uh, exposed their password. Uh, and not impossible to get all these cables. So that they can not be surveilled by the state. And uh, on the other hand, they break codes of the state and they break in. So as to try to make the government more transparent. Should the government, this is a direct answer to your question now, I asked him, is it your belief there should be no secrets? The government should have no secrets. He said, no, that's ridiculous. I said, well, give me an example of what shouldn't be. He said, well, private medical records, for example, that they collect, tax records, you know, various things like that. I could, I, I told him, I could give him a dozen other things that he might not have thought of. Uh, but he obviously, there were things that I would say should be secret that he wouldn't have thought of why they should be secret and so forth. Mm -hmm. But in, he, he readily, or I, perhaps not readily, but he did accept the idea of redaction of names of informants. So, for example, so he was not, he was careless on that. On the Afghan, fortunately, nothing seemed to come out of it. He's obviously accepted uh, that there should be redaction of the names of informants. They, in the philosophy, he had a theory early on, and he's you know, relatively young, has no political science training particularly, uh, 
but uh, has, he's very smart, brilliant, and uh, he's a computer person, basically, and he's done amazing work at, at manipulating the media, to get stuff into the media that, without his very ingenious tactics, would not have gotten out. But uh, it clearly was his opinion early on, and I think he hasn't totally abandoned this, that the more transparency of the government, uh, the better, and it can have only two different effects, which are both good. Uh, one is that they stop doing things that are criminal and that have to be kept secret or that they're embarrassed about. They pursue policies that don't require this much secrecy. Um, by the way, I, as far as I can tell, I haven't seen that he's thought about the legitimacy or illegitimacy of the relations between states. He's not very fond of any states known to me, and I don't think he's thought much about uh, what, where it might be legitimate to keep certain things secret uh, from the others. But he can, he, can, he can be convinced. But the other thing he said was, or they will go in the direction of greater secrecy. That will make them more compartmented, less efficient, it will, in, in, um, it will impose on them a secrecy tax. And the effect of that will be they will be more brittle, more vulnerable, more easy to overthrow, more democratic. He definitely, uh, that I think doesn't happen, in my opinion. That's, in theory, could happen. But they can live with a lot of secrecy tax. They can afford a lot of secrecy tax. Fascisms, military systems of any kind can live very well for 30, 40 years, keeping very tight secrets. It may not be highly efficient. Things happen as a result. 9-11 from compartmentation uh, is coming out more and more. It was an aspect. But was that bad from the point of view of the state? Not from the point of view of George W. Bush or Obama, as far as I can tell, who has followed exactly in that. So it hasn't caused the downfall of the state, uh, the extreme secrecy that they had. Uh, what they constantly talk, he has responds very much to the word justice, in favor of justice. I am very ambivalent toward that word, to tell the truth, for a number of reasons. But in terms of freedom and democracy, those are his words. He wants to democratize countries in general. His first target in mind, in his early works of WikiLeaks, was China. That was the example of the closed society that he felt was vulnerable to being opened up and he got a lot of leaks from Chinese. In fact, his big problem there was how to do anything with it without exposing the identity of the people who had given it to him, and he wanted to keep that secret. <coughs> also, Nigeria, corruption, corruption in Kenya. As far as I know, almost all he's gotten from the U.S. government is from Bradley Manning, if, if Manning is the source, is from one source. So he didn't start out American, on America. He, In fact, he regarded to start with America as the country he had least to worry about. He's changed his mind on that, I think, as I would. But his main targets are totally closed societies like China. Okay, let's open it up to Tom and Sandy. What, what is he... I just wanted, I wanted to make a note about Reuters that you mentioned earlier. Yeah. Of all the news agencies and of all the... Reuters has been the one that has challenged the U.S. military the most. They've also lost a number of people in my film... A WMD. I, hmm. I look at the uh, the uh, Palestine Hotel incident, where I spoke with a Reuters journalist and, and and also quote the head of Reuters, who tried to get information from the U.S. government, which refused to provide it, and Reuters reported that, whereas other outlets didn't. But wh what do you think? He he's had this F made this effort to work with major media outlets, and they seem to have either betrayed him or he betrayed them. I don't no. know. They, he's on bad terms for just slightly different reasons, very much with the New York Times. He was uh, overly shocked by a hit piece that the New York Times did for John Burns, which was a kind that I was shocked too when the first time the hit, Times hit me with that. That's what I had to tell him. And I told him in some detail, well, you get used to it. You just have to get used to it. I don't think he's unusually thin-skinned. When you find somebody that you feel you've sort of been on a team with or something, and then they write slanderous stuff, false stuff or, uh, uh, about you, it's startling. But uh, eventually you get used to it. Well, you know, I mean, personally, like being called traitor. 
I mean, it took me a long time to get used to that. Personally, as a journalist who worked in the mainstream media, uh, lamestream media, however you refer mm -hmm. to it, uh, you know, it's almost like their own, the idea that someone else could outscoop them and report information that they haven't is seen as an affront. Yeah. And so by discrediting them, they're yeah. sort of recrediting themselves as being the place to turn to. Mm -hmm. And well, as I was, I haven't talked to him all that much. I, I was recently, and I was trying to tell him. It took me a long time, and, and this I don't. This is not a criticism of mainstream media. It's two different cultures. It took me for a long time to realize just what exclusivity meant to them, how crucial that was. You know, as a model, obviously it has a commercial aspect, but it goes beyond that. Uh, the idea of having a scoop or being scooped really cuts to their identity you know, in a terrible way. So if you interfere with their exclusivity, as he did, and as I did at various times, really without thinking too much about it, he and I, our attitude was, we want to get this stuff out, you know, and yeah, I know they want to have it exclusively, but you can't take it quite as seriously uh, as they do. But, um, so, and The Guardian, uh, he had a, a comparable problem. But he did, in the end, you know, give it to, I think, like 59 different uh, organizations. And... Uh, Here's a very important one that he's, he's drawn attention to. He was not the first or the main one to associate uh, WikiLeaks or Manning with the Tunisian rebellion, which in turn, as everybody knows, uh, led to the Egyptian uh, with the help of the Serbian uh, activists who had been talking to the Egyptians for a long time about nonviolent action. But everybody agrees that the Serbian, the Egyptian moves were stimulated by very comparable moves in Tunisia just a little bit earlier. Well, what happened in Tunisia? Uh, the first person, uh, Tunisia, uh, had banned Al Jazeera, which WikiLeaks was cooperating with. But uh, I think Le Monde got in. And it was one of the things that made The Guardian mad was that. Uh, uh, Assange had insisted on bringing Le Monde and El Pais, as they describe it. He wanted romance languages. He wanted to get the uh, romance. He wanted a different language area to get in on this. And so they gave it to Le Monde and El Pais. And um, it was Le Monde who reprinted this stuff from the cables. I just read today, reading about Gaddafi, that uh, one of the first people to announce uh, to denounce WikiLeaks for, and link it to Tunisia was Gaddafi announced long before anything had started in, in uh, Benghazi or Tripoli this is a WikiLeaks revolution these outsiders these agitators brought this about <laughs> to our good friend Ben Ali Ben Ali hadn't, hadn't left yet and he was still supporting Ben Ali he said Ben Ali is under attack by WikiLeaks says Gaddafi well there was quite a bit of uh, attempt at the time then it was all overshadowed by Egypt. That Tunisia was the first WikiLeaks revolution. That's what they say. It was also called an Internet revolution, but a WikiLeaks revolution. And the point there was, uh, by the way, uh, Assange has an interesting angle on that. It's usually said, everybody says, well, everybody knew they were corrupt. You know, what's the news here to say that it was corrupt? Uh, some people said, well, seeing it in print or seeing the Americans say it somehow makes it more vivid. But Assange... Uh, spelled out in some detail based on whether it's only his own conjecture or more information, I'm not sure. But in some detail later on, his understanding of what happened in Tunisia. He says <coughs> that reading that this was the opinion of the American consul or ambassador in Tunisia to the American State Department and having that in the American press meant that it would be hard for the U.S. to support Ben Ali against an uprising mm -hmm. as the U.S. would otherwise be inclined to do. Are you following? So that the, the awareness of this, precisely <coughs> the admission that we saw it, we, the ambassador, saw it that way, that the American people saw it that way, would make it hard for us to support this corrupt Ben Ali, and that encouraged them, that said, this is the time for revolt because the U.S., which has been supporting Ben Ali, by the way, remember all these reports of corruption for which our diplomats were given a lot of credit. A lot of people read that and said, wow, we didn't know our 
Foreign Service wrote so well, and we didn't know they were so acute and critical and all this. And nobody sort of mentioned, yes, but we were supporting all of these people that they were reporting on, continuing to. So they said, okay, after reporting this, it's going to be harder for them to put us down. And their fear, above all, in, in going against Ben Ali was not a fear of the Tunisians. It was a fear of the U.S. And the U.S. was put out of this. Now that's what Assange says, rightly or wrongly. In any case, there seems little question that two individuals had a great deal of power in bringing down a dictatorship. Mohammed Bouazizi, who did what the monks had done in 63 in Saigon, burned himself to death publicly, led to demonstrations, the local secret police fire on the demonstrations, more demonstrations, bigger demonstrations, in Saigon I'm talking about now, eventually the children of the generals join the demonstrations, and Ziem is brought down, which the Viet Cong, this is 63 now, the Viet Cong never got close to being able to topple Ziem. But a handful, about a dozen monks and nuns who burned themselves to death, brought down Ziem. Wasn't he okay, in Buazizi, you know, the vegetable seller, the college educated guy, he was one critical person. Again, demonstrations, they were fired on. And around, it actually was a little before that, a little before Buazizi, the stuff coming out in Le Monde and being reprinted from WikiLeaks and the cables. And everybody there at the time was commenting on. So, there will undoubtedly be statues to Mohammed Bouazizi in Tunis, mm. and there may well be statues of Bradley Manning. Mm. <laughs> David? Um, about the civilian death toll in Iraq, when, when the Hopkins study came out, it was widely criticized in the press, and the press coverage was so naive and so technically uninformed that I made a project of reading all of the estimates. And the Hopkins study was quite brilliant. I was lecturing around the country for PSR. It was actually about 700,000 at that time. But a subsequent study, which you may have seen, see. is well over a million yeah. at about the same time. So the total at this time has to be in the range of a million and a half. And if you count Afghanistan, God knows. Yeah. But but the technology that the Hopkins people did was brave. They went into dangerous areas. They did absolutely sophi highly sophisticated sampling techniques, and it was it was a brilliant study. And so I I have no question that that those are as secure data as will ever be gotten in a war zone or somewhere like it. The lack of interest in this country, in the media, the Congress, the executive, the public, for the answer to the question, how many people have died as a result of our actions in Iraq, is disgusting, disgraceful, vicious, very human. It's the way it is. We didn't invent that, that way of behaving. It's really terrible. And the same is true in Afghanistan. And in fact, there's a new book out by Steven Pinker, of which I read, I just got it. Read about a third, yeah. The Better Angels of Our Nature. And it has a kind of bizarre thesis, uh, you know, which is that we're getting, people are getting kinder and kinder and gentler and compared to other periods and so forth. There have been some good criticisms of that in The New Yorker and elsewhere. But I look, I've read it, and by the way, there's a lot of interesting stuff in it. I, I intend to read it not only for disgust, uh, but for information. But on Iraq, which I looked up, uh, he gives us an example that war has gotten gentler, and he says because people don't like American casualties, so we have to conduct it without casualties, as in Kosovo, we have to do it from the air. He, uh, you know, this is exactly true. So we have to use drones in Pakistan, drones in Afghanistan, rely on those assassination squads, and keep the American casualties down. So he said, for whatever reason, well, what are the fact is only 4,000 dead in Iraq, only 3,000 in Afghanistan. So that's his example of how, for whatever reason, war has gotten less bloody. There is no mention of how many people have died, civilian or otherwise, in Afghanistan or only American. And he's not talking about America. This is a book about humanity. 
And his example <laughs> is that we have lost fewer people in those wars. Now, I would say for the reviewer not to notice that in the New York Review is yeah. disgusting. Well, it's worth stopping right there in terms of, as you say, that being a universal tendency, which we've seen very strongly in America during mm -hmm. its recent frequent wars. Um, it's easy to numb yourself toward the deaths of enemies or non-combatants, especially toward those people whom you're not supposed to kill. Uh, and one has the most sensitive antennae toward the deaths of one's own buddies. Uh, most of the Vietnam veterans I work with turned against the war. Well, I mean, you, you have more direct experience, more for uh, in response to the confrontation with the death of buddies than the enemy, but there were some, and this was to the credit of uh, anti-war veterans who really felt the experience, experienced as extremely painful the killing even of an enemy soldier and even more of, an en of, a, of a Vietnamese non-combatant. Uh, they, they were increasingly exceptional. So what you're describing is, is a universal tendency perhaps, but we are responsible as Americans for our expression of that universal tendency, and we've had quite a few wars in a short space of time. Look, there have been seven or eight uh, profiles of Bradley Manning come out. No reporter, no reporter in uh, the 18 months he's been imprisoned has talked with him, privately or otherwise. He's incommunicado from that point of view. So we have these interviews, these profiles based on other people, and I could go into that. But nearly all of them, people, front line, uh, the New York Times, very much so, uh, and a number of others, all take the point, here is this troubled kid, yeah. uh, gay, uh, apparently something that was withheld uh, in the uh, chat logs until they were finally published entirely, uh, was that he was interested in transitioning eventually. He's five foot two, by the way, and uh, you know, very androgynous looking, but he uh, not mentioned any other time in his profile, but in these chat logs, um, actually, he mentions the idea of transition in, to a girl, and uh, the uh, Wired managed to interview the psychotherapist to whom he'd had private consultations with on this subject, who felt that, well, since he's in jail, he'll be there forever, uh, why shouldn't I be telling all these discussions, you know, and so forth. So it's a long interview with him. So uh, uh, in all these pieces, though, they say, here is this troubled kid, uh, uh, very bothered and so forth, flaky, strange, uh, dissident, wherever he was and so forth. <laughs> why did he do it? You know, why did he do it? Maybe for publicity? And absolutely ignoring what is right there to be read in the wired logs that he has, why he says what he did it. He says on the, he talks about the torture incident. He talks about the video in great length and the killing and maybe that will reveal what we're doing to these people over here. And then on the cables, he says it's not only what Americans are doing, it's not only revealing crime by Americans. He says, here's his summary of what the 260,000 cables said, which so until two months ago, only some 2,000, maybe 3,000 had been released out of 260,000. And he said, people say, well, gee, where's the scandal about the U.S.? Not very much at the secret level. That's not where you find the scandals about the U.S. Let me tell you one little thing. When I, when I was assistant to the Assistant Secretary of Defense, uh, in 1964, I found that to keep the cables I was reading for him about Vietnam down to five feet of cables a day instead of the 12 feet otherwise, I asked the communication center to send me only top secret, eyes only, or limb disk, limited distribution, X disk, executive distribution, secret, Nothing just plain secret, nothing confidential, nothing unclassified. None of that would get in, these 260,000 cables. All he had was unclassified, confidential, and secret. So for a year in the Pentagon, I never read anything as low as the stuff he put out. 
Well, I thought it probably didn't amount to much. I had enough to read. Now when I read this stuff, I think, gee, I, may, I must have missed. Uh, quite a bit. I, actually, there are a lot of interesting things in this. But you don't really find American crimes at the secret level. That's at the limb disc, the no disc. That's at the top secret level or even higher, several clearances higher. So uh, he's constantly, though, saying there are crimes in every capital in the world. He said, this shows what the first world does to the third world.